And so our great God, we're here to worship you because you are glorious. We know there's never a second in the heavens where the angels aren't singing your glories. There will be but a half an hour pause, we're told, later on. And that's when you're going to reveal something even more glorious about your glory. But for now, they're singing. And here, we're singing. And we're praising you. We're going to praise you, God, through the preaching of your word. As we listen to what you have to say. We're going to praise you, Lord, as we partake of the cup and of the bread later on in our time together. And we're going to praise you through everything we do and say in this place, in this day. Because you are glorious. And we want your glory to shine in us and through us. You delight in revealing your glory. And we pray you would, through our time together, through one another, as we draw close to you and look upon the crucified one and realize that he did that, that we might forever be with you. We thank you so much. And now help us to continue in this time focused upon Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the title for this message is The Promise of Access to God, which in itself should get you quite excited. This is a promise God has given to those who love him. We, first Sunday of each month, spend the morning drawing close to the Lord, meditating upon the finished work of Christ, the bread, the cup we share of, we pass around among the believers here and each time we're just picking up on the next uh, section as much as anything of Hebrews. The chapter headings aren't always in the most helpful positioning in the page in, in the book of Hebrews but the first consideration was considering that Jesus is worthy to be worshipped as he is the son who is God. We thought about that as an opening to this book of Hebrews the second visit to this book, we considered how he's worthy to be worshipped because he's the son who came in the flesh, who was incarnate, received carne, flesh. He lived and walked among the people alive in that age, that place, 2,000 years ago in the Middle East. And this one, and because of him, we have a promise of rest with God. And the last message we focused upon that and that's where it's sort of crossing over chapter 3 and 4. And this particular message will be crossing over chapter 4 and 5. Again, the, the, the chapter headings aren't always in the most helpful position. We're, we're really looking at sections of this book. And there's so much that the writer to the Hebrews wants to say. And you can just see he's, he's just desperately wanting to pour these wonderful truths into this teaching. And for, for the preacher to also to try and draw attention to specifics and not say everything that could be said as far as I understand is that's, that's quite a discipline, that's not easy. Um, but certainly there's so much going on here and what the writer to the Hebrews is doing is just building up this picture of Jesus. He's just piling on these layers and showing you the glory and the wonder of him, who he is and what he's done. He's the object of our faith and that's really the objective of the writer to the Hebrews, just to present to us Jesus, greater than, uh, more wonderful than, the fulfillment of, and our surety, and our mediator, and there's so many uh, wonderful truths that have come through this series, little by little. But just to remind us of last time, we were thinking about the promise of rest with God, and, and how so few came into that rest. Some did, but so few. There was this perpetual disobedience, and disobedience is the external reaction to disbelief. So as far as they were disbelieving, so they were disobedient. And in fact, the word is even interchangeable, which is very interesting. The word that we have in our English Bibles as disobedience in those verses there uh, can also be synonymous with disbelief. So the disbelief, that's a heart issue. And disobedience, that's a living out of that. That's a playing out of that. You are what you eat, to a degree, and you will behave as you think, to a degree. Uh, that will often be the case. Now, there's a positive side to this. Your obedience will be an outworking of your faith, your true faith. 
you only believe so far as you obey. Where your obedience stops and disobedience begins, well, that's where your faith has ended and your disbelief has taken over. So last time we were thinking about that in more details and the recording we have if you're interested to dive into that in more detail. But, so there were many who failed to enter into that rest. But we have. We have. Are we better than they? No, we're not. God has done a work of grace in our lives, us who are truly Christians, followers of Christ. We have entered into God's rest. The rest that Joshua failed to give to the nation as a whole, Jesus has given to his people for whom he came to die for. And we rest from our works to try and merit salvation. You know, we, we rest from our efforts to try and get into a right standing before God because of what we have done. And we rest in the confidence that Jesus has done it all. That's the rest that we enjoy. And at a time like this that we focus in upon also and explore the, the glory of that rest that we're enjoying even now. And maybe it might cause us to marvel sometimes at some who seem to happily forfeit, you know, the enjoyment of that rest. They, they seem to almost deliberately put obstacles in their way or, or at least they don't reach out to the channels that, grace has give, that God has given through which we receive the grace of God. And we'll be exploring that a little bit, some of these channels of God's grace that he has afforded us that we must make the most of and enjoy. And so draw close to him and we are to call we are to draw close to God the former the other message in another series in the book of Acts was focusing upon how God is sovereign in salvation and I wasn't able to also explore and man's responsibility because they are both truths God is sovereign and we are responsible for all we do and do not do all we say and do not say and I wasn't able to focus on the latter so much as focusing on the sovereignty of God in salvation. But in this study, we will be thinking a little bit about our responsibility uh, as well to draw close to God. And those verses in James are worth exploring later on, where it's laid out very clearly the responsibility uh, for us to draw close to him. And he graciously draws close to us. Uh, there's a, a number of quotes came to mind as I was preparing this message. And it was interesting how many of them I was looking for, and I found them in Hebrews. <laughs> it was just quite an interesting experience for me as I was preparing this message. And I was thinking about the anchor of the soul, and I thought, now where is it? I know it says that somewhere in the Bible. And I found it right here in Hebrews, chapter 6. Where it's, and again, those verses, it really is teaching something about this anchor, this hope that we have, uh, is really focused upon the fact that this God who does not change, immutable is a beautiful word, he's unchangeable, Therefore, what he has said, his promises are reliable. If he doesn't change, his words will not change. He will fulfill his promises. And as we explore the scriptures, we can see how Christ brings to fruition those promises that God has given. So the unchangeable God has given irrevocable promises that the glorious Jesus brings to realisation, into reality. And, and we receive the blessing of that. And that's also something we're going to be looking at uh, in this particular message. And we look to the word of God, don't we? This is how we form our understanding. We think God's thoughts after him as we explore the scriptures to see what he has said on these things. And that's what we're going to do right now as we read from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12, until chapter 5, verse 10. The word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, 
yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins, and he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and who are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes his honour on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. There's a lot there. And I won't be building on every point by point as perhaps we would if it was a different type of a series. But we're going to be focusing upon some of uh, the, the central truths there that we might better appreciate who this Jesus is and what he has done to have brought us together and even more wonderfully to bring us together with God himself in time and for eternity. And it's a time such as now when we can focus upon that and enjoy that. And that verse 16 in chapter 4 is really one of, maybe is the key verse. It is the key verse for this particular consideration that we may approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There's a lot of needy people out there, but so few realise where their source of help comes from. Now the word of God is what we have before us, and it's described as that double-edged sword, it cuts. It's the word of God that reveals to us the glory of God. That's one of the main purposes of the Bible, that God would reveal his glory to us. And as he reveals his glory to us, that also shines a light upon our own soul. And we realise how we've fallen short. And, and so by the Spirit at work in us, we, we seek out Christ and our need for him is revealed and the sufficiency of him is revealed. And, and so in the word of God, there's this, at least these two truths prominent there. The glory of God revealed and our need for Jesus revealed as the glory of Jesus is revealed. This is what happens in the word of God and it can be cutting sometimes. It can seem to overwhelm us at times. It can penetrate deeply. It, it, it judges. It reveals. It helps us in our time of need. And it also helps us to examine our own hearts. And at such a time as this, it's very important to examine our hearts as to where our true affections lie. To put it in other words, who do you love most? Who do you love most? If it's not Jesus, you're not a Christian. To put it simply. We were sat at the dinner table and, and Mikey got it upon himself to put in order those he loves most in the family. And he was going through this order, and we knew he was going to get to the person he loves the least. You know, and that wouldn't be kind for that person. So we stopped him in his tracks before he went too far. He's like, Mikey, that's, that's not a nice way to speak, really, you know, and to be thinking like that. But I can say this, he did begin with God. And I think Lily was perhaps the bottom at that pile. But the, 
The fact is, he did start with God. Now, I don't know if you were put in a position you had to put in order those in your family to whom you love the most, but I would hope to think that God is first, truly. He is first, the first place. If anyone or anything else is there, that's your idol to be dealt with, destroyed. Now, a time like this is not that we would doubt our salvation, reflect on a week of failings and shortcomings and come here in a flustered state thinking, I don't even feel worthy to be able to take off the bread and the wine. I just, I've let the law down too many times this week. My mind is distracted. My heart is divided. And, and it's not a time to cause the believer to doubt. Okay? And in fact, I heard a lovely phrase from someone who struggled much with doubts. And he said that he has been told that he must doubt his doubts, okay? That's what you've got to do. <laughs> doubt your doubts. Uh, now, if your faith is built upon the promises of God's word, then you doubt your doubts, okay? And a uh, time like this is wonderful to read, orientate our thoughts as we draw close to our great God and to remember the confidence that we can have. We don't come here in our own confidence. We come here in the confidence that Jesus is Jesus, and he's done what the Bible said he did. That's our confidence upon the very words of God. Now, Job was a man of God who suffered much. He truly suffered. And in the middle of his suffering, he said these words of God. He knows the way that I take. You know, he had he'd lost his children through death. He'd lost his money. He'd lost his goods, his livestock, he'd lost everything that he, he loved and relied upon, but he could still say, he knows my way. He knew, God knew. His friends didn't understand, his wife didn't understand, but he knew God did. He knew, God knew the way that he was taken, and he knew that at the end of it, he would come out tested as, as gold. And he, he, his confidence was the fact that he says, my feet have closely followed his steps. I've kept his way uh, without turning aside. And what he learned to do very cleverly is to put his feet in the footprints of Jesus. And that is what we need to do. As we walk through this difficult life with its challenges, its obstacles, we need to learn to put our feet in the footprints of Jesus as we follow him. And he's taken us home. He's not going to leave you halfway somewhere. Purgatory, no. He's going to take you all the way home. And, and the, the path that we're treading is one that he's trod before us. He knows what it's like to suffer and to be challenged in different ways. There's that saying, isn't there, about to really understand someone, you've got to walk a mile in their moccasins, in their sandals. And to really, before we criticise and, and speak poorly upon someone, you need to experience something of what they're going through, really. Uh, and it's just not what the Lord Jesus did when he came in the flesh, uh, that he would understand our weaknesses and be able to sympathise, to sympathise, uh, to come alongside us and to help us uh, who are tempted. He was tempted but never sinned, and to help us in our time of need. And it's with that confidence that we come to the throne of grace uh, mindful of the mercy we've been promised that we will receive. He will not treat us as we deserve. He treated Jesus on the cross as we deserve. And so we are promised mercy and we are promised grace, grace sufficient, grace uh, to take us all the way home. In the Garden of Eden, there was two trees in the middle, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. And in a sense, we now have access to both trees. There was a, a season where God had said, enjoy that tree of life, but don't touch the tree of knowledge. And I must emphasize this, the tree of knowledge was not evil. It was a tree of knowledge of good and evil, but the tree was not evil. It was good. It was all good. God had said it's all good, didn't he? It's all good. After the fall, then the corruption of sin touched Everything, tainted everything in creation. But they were for a season not to touch that tree of knowledge. 
but through disobedience they did and so disobeyed God fell into sin and now they would also be barred from eating of the tree of life and cast out of that garden and they were cast out in a state of dying in their ignorance and yet now the Lord Jesus has come and he tells us that he came that we might have life and, and have it to the full the fullness of life not just to survive but to thrive to flourish and to know the joy of knowing him he came to, that we might have that fullness of life he who is spoken of as the last adam the life giving spirit through the first adam we were barred from that tree of life but through the last adam he's the one who gives us uh, the spirit of life the the spirit of god infuses us abides in us christ lives his life in us through us and if only we realized that more he was full of grace and truth how do you know what is true but as it accords to the one who is true the one is the way the truth and the life truth is in him he is truth life is in him he is life and he's our life and we do well to remember these things there's a sermon in every one of these lines of course but together with the father this is what he did he gave us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know him better some boast of having this spiritual gift of that spiritual gift but if that spiritual gift doesn't lead you to know him more biblically and fully and to serve him more faithfully then that is not a gift from the spirit at all because the spiritual gifts lead you to know him and to serve him more fully so in a sense we do take off that tree of life and that tree of knowledge as we commune with God by his spirit. Now these aren't just lovely sounding words, profound thoughts, there's a reality to them. So how therefore can we draw grace from that throne and bask in that glory of knowing God and walking by his spirit? How? The answer it is very simple and you know it already. Prayer is such a powerful channel by which God graces us. Every grace that comes to us comes through Jesus. So as we pray in his name uh, and the spirit here on earth intercedes with us and helps us know what to pray about and as we pray those prayers received by our intercessor in glory that's the Lord Jesus who perfects those prayers presents them to the Father and so we have this communion with God and then we see the answers to these prayers uh, once perfected so they're not always answered exactly as we prayed but they are always answered exactly according to so God's sovereign purposes we see these prayers answered and we, we rejoice in our God and go thank you for involving me in that that's amazing and, and so then we pray with thanksgiving. And so this prayer life is a channel by which we receive the grace. And when we pray, we're right there in the heavenlies. Our bodies elsewhere, but our spirit is there in and before the throne of grace. We meditate upon the word of God. It's a, a very important way. You see, many people can act with arrogance if we're not careful we expect God to listen to our words but we're not necessarily willing to listen to his that's arrogance we have to guard our hearts with that it's a wise thing I believe to pray with the Bible within reach because God might just talk back <laughs> and you need to be ready to hear what he's going to say to you uh, as you have this converse with God you speak to God God speaks back and then you you, you ask him, help me to understand this and lead me through these truths and help these truths apply to my life and, and, and these different things come into our prayer and we're communing with our God and, and so God graces us and we receive this grace from his throne as we meditate upon his word prayerfully. And then as we come together in fellowship, it's an amazing channel of God's grace to us. We draw close to the throne of his grace and we receive this blessing as we draw close to one another. We can see God at work in each other. We can be challenged. 
encourage one to love and good deeds. We need one another. We need to grow together. We need God to be ever so patient with us. And he will use one another to help us to grow in this grace as we learn more of him. And then if you put all those three together, the climax of it would be a service such as this, where we draw close together, searching his word prayerfully and tasting of that bread and that wine. And remember, the focus of God's word is his glory. And the focus of the ministry of the Lord Jesus was to reveal that glory. He came to reveal the Father, to teach us what he's like. And then he sent the Spirit to lead us into all truth as we continue to learn to grow. And we're being prepared. We're a bride being prepared to abide with our Lord and God forever. We need a time like this as we can refocus alike. And the word Eucharist, just to remind us, is thanksgiving. It's that ancient word that the Christians always used at a time such as this to say we're going to have a thanksgiving service. We're going to give thanks uh, to the Lord Jesus. And that's what we are doing right now. Now in the 10th century and through the medieval age, people thought it's a good idea to do jousting, particularly in England and other European countries. They would joust. And there was, it was quite fascinating. The word joust, I don't know if anyone knows what that word means. It's got a French root to it, to joster is to approach or to meet. So these fellas, what they would do, and at first they didn't even have like a, a wooden fence between them. It was just an open field and they would just charge at each other um, with their, their pointed uh, little spears and try and knock each other off. And, and then they would have various rounds with knives and bludgeons and they'd have various rounds and it, it became a sport. Lots of things have come out of this that you won't realise. Has anyone ever worn a tie? Do you know where the concept comes from? From the knights and their jousting. What they would do is they would represent a family, usually a noble family, who would choose their hero. You're going to represent us. And so that hero, the knight, would, who would go around the field and he would come to his noble family and the, the, the lord of the family, who would then put their signature bandana around the neck of the knight. So he knew that, you know, this guy's representing us. This is our family crest that's upon him, and off he would go, and businessmen still wear ties today. And then also uh, the, um, the salute. Ever wonder where that came from? Yes, You've got to go quick up and slow down. That's how I was taught. Uh, and the idea was that how do you know that's your knight? Because he's got all this armour on, hasn't he? He could be anyone. You could have chosen a, a wonderful hero, and then someone swapped him for the village idiot, and you wouldn't know, because he's there with all this armour on. So he would have to come to his noble family, he would lift up his visor and say, it is I, <laughs> like that, and he put his visor down again. So that's the idea of the, the salute came from that too. So there's a lot to come out of this, but the idea was, here was a hero, here was one chosen to represent the family. He would have to have the correct attire to be able to do the job at hand, and he would be identified, he would wear the crest, and then he would go into battle to joust, to meet with another. And that was the idea there. And it's not so different to the idea of the high priest. He similarly would have been selected among the men of the tribe of Levi, and he would be selected to represent the people. He too would have to wear the correct attire uh, for the work at hand. And there's all sorts of lovely teachings in each one of those, which we're not going to go into. Um, just to say that upon the ephod, he would have the stones, he'd have the names of the tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob, and stones also to represent them, and many other things going on there. But upon his turban, he would have a pure gold plate that was sewn into the turban. And upon that plate, it would read, holy to the Lord. And holiness was essential for this one to be able to enter into the presence of God, to joust with God, 
to draw near, to approach, to meet with God, representing his people to come before his God. Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And we'll be looking at that in more detail later on when we get to that particular passage. And, and the high priest would not enter empty-handed. There'd be a sacrifice made and the blood of which taken in to the holy place and once a year into the holy of holies places, the holiest place of all. And it'd be presented upon the Ark of the Covenant and prayers would be given. And, and if the Lord struck him down dead, they would have put a, a, a thin rope on his ankle. They would hear the bells. And if the bells stopped, that means his movement stopped. And they would know he's been struck down dead. And they'd be able to put him out of there because they couldn't go in to get him. Or they'd be struck down dead too. God is a consuming fire. And if he were to reject the sacrifice, the judgment would fall upon the people sooner or later. And that happens sooner rather than later with two of the four sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, who gave unauthorized fire. They did everything right, but they were not holy to the Lord. And instead of the fire falling upon the sacrifice and consuming it, fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. God is a holy God. God is a consuming fire. Those who approach him must know. He says, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honoured. If any unholy thing enters or attempts to enter the presence of God, it will be consumed by God's holiness. There must be a hell. It must be an eternal hell. And all those who are unholy will eternally perish there in a way that perhaps the, the fiery bush that Moses saw was on fire and yet not fully consumed, so those shall be in hell for an eternity, as God's holiness is poured upon them and it will perpetually consume them. They will never stop sinning in hell and so they will never stop deserving that wrath of God. That would have been our future too if we dared to approach God in our own state of holiness, because we are not holy, we are unholy. And so we have a, naturally a problem. How can a holy God look upon us who are unholy in and of ourselves? He can't. He must judge and he must punish. He must honour his own holiness. And therefore, we need one to stand in the gap. We need one who is altogether holy and able to represent us, who are the unholy ones. And that was the role of the high priest. Uh, but they could only serve for so long, and they died, and then they were replaced. They had to give a sacrifice for themselves and then for the people. And it was always temporary until the next time, until the next sacrifice. And yet... The Lord Jesus came in the order of Melchizedek. We will be looking into that on a later study. There's five times Melchizedek is mentioned in the book of Hebrews and only two other times elsewhere in the scriptures. And we'll be looking at that in more detail another time, but I'll just remind us that among the much symbolism and meaning to his name and his position, you have the understanding of his role was non-transferable. Melchizedek, his role was non-transferable. Now, there's a lot more we could say about that. And he was the type, and Jesus is the fulfillment. So there were many priests in the Aaronic uh, priesthood, but there's only one in the Melchizedekal priesthood. Melchizedek was the type, Jesus, the fulfillment. What Jesus did and who Jesus is, is non-transferable. We don't become priests, Melchizedek Zinus. <laughs> We don't do that. We're not that. There's only ever one. That's him. But we come under his protection. He represents us. He is the Holy One of Israel who stands in the presence of the Holy God representing us. Who in itself and of ourselves are unholy, but he is our holiness, we're told at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He is our holiness. 
So God can look upon us and he sees the holiness of his son, the righteousness of his son upon us. Our sins have been dealt with at the cross. There's nothing that Satan can accuse us of. There's nothing yet to be paid. It's all been paid for. It's all been dealt for. You are more innocent than newborn children because you're pure. You're perfected in the sight of God. Your position is as holy ones. You are holy ones and part of that holy nation because of the Lord Jesus. He, we're told in verse 7, he, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears. I wonder how much you've thought about that. I wonder how many times we have had wet eyes in our prayers or how often are they dry? When did the Lord offer up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears? And I doubt there's ever a time he came down from those mountain experiences with dry eyes as he'd spent a night in the presence of his father praying on behalf of you, even then interceding. One of the climax times, of course, would have been in the Garden of Gethsemane, where not just his eyes would have been crying tears, but his the pores of his skin were crying tears of blood as he was agonizing over what he would do for you, how he would bring you into communion with him and what was necessary, that cup that must be drunk to the absolute dregs, that cup of God's wrath uh, that you and I deserved and ought to have drunk for all eternity. But he said, no, no, I, I will drink that cup. And he submitted his will to the Father, and he drank that. And so he was heard. His prayers were heard through his reverent submission. You've got the first Adam, uh, the unholy one who in defiance sought out his will, his own good pleasure and glory. And the whole world is suffering the consequences of that to this day. But then came that second Adam, the last Adam. He came in reverent submission, saying, not my will, Father, be done, but your will be done. And he came to fulfill that will. I don't know if you've wondered about that verse 8, where it tells us that he was learning, that the Lord Jesus was made perfect, implying he wasn't perfect before. And sometimes those thoughts can mess with our minds. We're thinking, God, why is that there? And as much as anything, it's for us to better understand that the eternal plan of God to save his people from their sins was now brought into experience, into reality, realized. It was the perfect eternal plan that was now perfectly executed by the Lord Jesus Christ. So he, in his substance, in his nature, in his personhood, wasn't made perfect. He already was but he perfectly became that high priest. Many had come before and had to be replaced by the next one, the next one. But he perfected that high priestly role. Many had interceded and mediated for the people of God, but he would be the intercessor who would perfect that and our prayers. So he brought into reality that through physical experience, time and space experience. It was no longer just a plan in the heavenlies, but now a plan that has worked out through time and space here on earth. The, the will of God in heaven here on earth, perfectly realized through Jesus, that he would be that source of our eternal salvation. And the source of our eternal salvation, if only Many people realise what that word means. It would put to rest a lot of error within Christendom. And the word source, it means the cause of the originator and also the one who's responsible for. So if Jesus is the source of your salvation, if he is the one who's the cause of it, the originator of it, and the one who's responsible for it, why should you ever doubt? 
Why should you ever think, yes, but what if I do this or do that or don't do this or don't do that and I might lose my salvation one day? That's impossible. It's impossible. If Jesus is the source of your salvation, it's impossible for you to be lost. He would have to be decrystallized for that to be happen. I just made that word up. <laughs> and of course, he will forever be the high priest, our representative, our Lord Jesus, the unchangeable, glorious one, who through him and because of him, verse 16 reminds us that we can now approach the throne of God's grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And this is a great time of need. We need to remember the one who is the source of our salvation and what it cost him to save us. There's bread here. Uh, and this bread reminds us of his body. Uh, his body that was broken and this body that, that suffered so much. It's a reminder of his body. His glorified body is in heaven. This is bread to remind us of his ministry here on earth and how he suffered. Real suffering. Real suffering. His tears were real tears. And his blood was real blood. Blood that was poured out through every part of his body. Again, there in Gethsemane, through the pores of his skin. And there, as he had that thorny crown pushed into his head, and he was whipped on his back, and he was nailed to that cross. And ultimately, a spear was thrust into uh, just below his heart. And so the water and the blood poured out there. This is, this is our Lord Jesus. This is how much he loves you. It, what more could he have done to show you his love? But that to have been treated so, and with the objective of knowing that you would be saved because of his finished work. We'll have a moment to examine our hearts, to think profoundly upon the Lord Jesus, to get right with him. If there's anything not right in your heart, in your mind, it's a lovely time in silent prayer to confess that and ask him to remove those things. Remember they've been dealt with at the cross and examine your heart. If you truly love the Lord Jesus, you are permitted to partake of the bread when it comes round. We'll eat it together and the cup when it comes round as well. If you love him sincerely and, and trusting him alone for your salvation, then this meal is for you. So we'll take a moment to examine our hearts, to think, to pray. And if someone could call the children in as well, that would be, that'd be lovely. So those who know and love the Lord Jesus, he came from glory to earth for you. He, he loves you that much. He came to open up the way to God. That we can come in confidence to his throne of grace and receive the grace we need. That we might worship him aright, serve him aright, love him aright. And so may the bread reminds you of the costs that Jesus gladly paid through his body, that that be so. We'll eat it together in a moment. As we break the bread and share of the cup, we're doing this in obedience. The Lord Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And the shedding of the blood is a reminder that the life is in the blood. He gave his life. It wasn't taken. He gave it voluntarily. And in the giving of his blood was the bringing to reality and fruition that covenant, that new covenant. Uh, we are covenant people in the covenant that God has made to save all those who look to him. And Jesus fulfilled all the law on our behalf. So he kept the covenant on our behalf. God kept his side of it to save all those who come to him. Jesus kept our side of it with perfect obedience. And so we will drink of the cup as it comes round 
and be thankful in our hearts for his perfect obedience. Oh, how thankful we are, Father, that you ever sent your son Jesus to this sorry, sin-filled world that it is. And we're so thankful that he came in obedience and he fulfilled all of your perfect will. He did everything necessary to save his people from their sins, us from our sins. There is now nothing that bars us from entering into your blessed promise. And we can do that, not cowering, wondering, are we going to be thrown out any minute? But with confidence, we shall receive mercy. We shall receive grace and abundantly so life and the fullness thereof. How wonderfully blessed we are, how joyful we ought to be to know that the cross today is an empty cross. There isn't a Jesus hanging upon a cross today. Oh no, we know that he who is the crucified one is also the risen one, is also the crowned one, the glorious one, the one who was and is and is to be, the one who shall return one day soon. And we should be joyful with that truth to know that when he comes, we will not cry out for the rocks to fall upon us through fear of looking into the face of the lamb. But we can look with confidence and say, yes, that's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, my sins. He's the one who's brought me near. In him, I have trust. He is my confidence, my rest, my mediator, my Lord and my God. How we thank you for Jesus. Keep us near to the shadow of the cross, the reminder of what was necessary and yet also joyful, that Jesus is the victor. And we through him are more than conquerors. What a great victor we have. What a great conqueror we have in Jesus. Thank you for Jesus.